Paul. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. We we just moved actually, so I'm I'm happy to be able to attend. Congratulations on the move. I forgot to ask you about that before we started the show because I, I was I was hoping you know everything went well. I hate moving. Oh my gosh, it sucks. It is the worst. I we you yeah, know I, we I don't like last, it either. We moved last summer, and if all goes according to plan, that will be my last one. I will die in this house. That's that's. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. I'm really hoping not to move again for another like ten years because we've moved every four years for the past Ugh. like over a decade. So hopefully we'll be here for a while. But you know you get in that mode where you're like, I've been moving for a month. And this will go on forever. And you just have to be like, no, this is going right. to be over soon. It's going to be over soon. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I did that unhinged post on Satisfactory. I, I think you read it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in that, while I was just ranting about all these, you know, Satisfactory is not a horrible game. It's just... It's got a couple things that really irritate me. And it was just like this tipping point where I finally realized the game was just making me crazy <laughs> and irritating me with the constant just oh, the stupid conveyor won't work. I've spent like 10 <laughs> minutes trying to lay out this ultra simple room to do something stupid and obvious. And it's just not worth it. Um... But so that got, but I was still in the mood for that kind of game. For whatever reason, I haven't been in the mood for like narrative stuff. So I was like, maybe I'll try Factorio again. And mm. wow, Factorio has had some massive updates since the last time I used it. For one thing, the, the modding interface is completely inter integrated now. So you open up mods and it lets you browse the directory of all mods out there oh, wow you know, yeah so like in most games you've got to like exit the game and go to the steam workshop and you know screw around and wait for them to download this in factorio you go to the mods thing you scroll through it you search you do whatever um you select some new mods and you hit commit and it downloads them and applies them and uh slick it is super slick. So one thing, um, it overcame the inherent, like, ugh, I don't want to figure out how to install mods because every game's a little different. This yeah, was completely yeah. turnkey. And I saw, I don't know, it wasn't a mod I downloaded, but there's a new game mode now called Rocket Race, where you start the game with all technology researched. Hmm. And you just, your goal is to just get to the rocket as fast as possible. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. And, oh, here's some, here's some other, you know, tools, alternate power sources, alternate ways of moving items around. And the next thing I knew, it was a week later. It just, <laughs> like, It was time to do the diecast again. Right. Really, that's what it felt like this last week. Like, my excuse lately has been, oh, I'm working on the book. I'm working on the book. And technically, I am still working on the book. But also, a lot of hours. <laughs> it's like Factorio feels like a whole new game. Um, they finished all the graphical updates. Like, they were, like, halfway done last time I checked on the game, which would have been, like, 2019 or something. But now it's all done, and it looks wonderful. And so, I went down the Factorio rabbit hole. And wow, this game is so good. So if for me, it's like up there with Minecraft <laughs> and Kerbal Space Program. It's just those incredible, just a gem of a game. Just this wonderful thing that just stays evergreen. Hmm. Yeah. For me, it's um, RimWorld. But I, I never really got into Factorio, but I should I should take a look at it again. Oh, I love it so much. Uh, all right. You have notes here that you want to talk about YouTube. Do they copyright and delete your channel or whatever it is they're doing these days? Yeah, that's the kind of thing they do, isn't it? No, it, this time it's um, it's kind of weird. One of my videos, they 
just decided that they should suggest it to people. And it started taking off. And it wasn't like immediately. It was like after been on the internet for, I don't know, maybe five months. Weird. I've had that happen with super popular videos have echoes. You know, it'll have the initial surge and then randomly six weeks later, I'll start getting a bunch of comments on it. And I'm like, did somebody link this on Reddit? Or is this the YouTube algorithm just decided to show that to a bunch of new people? And there's no way to tell. Yeah. In this case, there are some good tools for, for it telling you like in the in the analytics or whatever you know where are these links coming from and what's going on how's this getting in um but it's mostly just like other youtube videos like some other popular streamer or something content creator makes a video on on townscaper it's, it's it, so i made a little script in townscaper to or not in townscaper in python to edit townscaper levels and uh it the video is just like this 40 second long thing of me being like, hey, look, I filled the whole townscaper map up with blocks. Isn't that dumb? And like, that's it. <laughs> right. It, it was a fun little video. I like, you know, there were there were some good things in there in terms of presentation where um, you start off looking at the ground. And then you pull back and pull back as you're talking and pull back and you say, you know, and it creates this sort of suspense. Okay, how crazy is this going to get? And you, you know, you, when you run into a video like that, you got to finish it. <laughs> right. It's short, but it immediately grabs you, gets you curious, and then slowly reveals itself. It's just a great effect. Hmm. I, yeah, I like how it turned out, but it, it doesn't seem, it doesn't jump out as like, oh, everybody should watch this. But for whatever reason, it's like on the tail end of someone else's popular video, YouTube's like, hey, why don't you watch this video? Where a guy shows you, you can make the Kulan walled city in Townscape or whatever. Right. And it's just crazy because like most of my videos get about 100 views, maybe, maybe, you know, 20 or 40 uh the diecast gets about a hundred, but that's mostly from your site. So like, and I'm not complaining, like, you know, 20 is a lot more people than, uh, you know, most people get, but this video is getting like 20 to 40 views an hour. And it has been for months now. And like, I have no control over like where to guide that. It's just like YouTube decided, Hey, this thing should be seen. Isn't it weird? It's like, why, why this one? Why this one above this other one that I spent 10 times as many hours on? Yeah, yeah. Well, and as an example, like uh, last week, right before the diecast, I don't know, I, did I bring it up on the diecast? I don't think I did. I made a music video in Satisfactory. Or it's not in Satisfactory, it's set to the, the release music from Satisfactory re Update 3. You know, that really like hype uh, orchestral thing that they did with the, when they revealed the pipes. Yes. Yeah. So I... I had been thinking for a while, like, oh, I should really make like a music video with like all the pioneers playing violins or whatever. Um, and I found a tool to like pull assets out of Unreal Engine games. And so I pulled a bunch of assets out. And then as I was working on it, I was like, you know, it would really be better if it was like, like one of those um, self-playing orchestra things, you know, where like instead of the pioneer playing the violin, it's like a big machine that has like a bunch of violins in it or whatever. Right. And uh, so I put together this thing and like, it took me, I don't know, it took me a couple days to rip all the assets out and get them all set up in Blender and then another couple days to animate it all and like, you know, get it all rendered and everything. So it was like four days of work compared to like, you know, this Townscaper video was probably like two hours, including all the script writing. Um, and it's still got like less than 400 views, which is like how many views this other video gets like every day. It's just, it's just crazy. Right. The satisfactory music video is amazing. And please, if you're listening to the diecast, give it a watch. I'm going to have it in the show notes and consider sharing it. It is just so good. And definitely more as of this recording on Saturday night, it has 300 views and that's outrageously low. That's just stupid. Um, it actually had 311. Isn't that where YouTube videos used to get stuck? Like once they got 311, they stuck. I think there was something like that. 
Yeah, yeah. If if a video starts getting a huge number of views all at once, it once it gets above 300, then it starts doing a vetting process to all further views so it doesn't update for a while. So yeah, they would get right. they would get stuck at that number. I don't know if they still do. Right. I think it was just randomly I landed on 311. And I always wondered like why 311? Why not 256 <laughs> or something? Yeah. Um, but anyway, or maybe it was 310. At any rate, um, please, let's see if we can do better, because this is such a fun video. And it's, it's only that high because I, when I posted it, I posted it to the Satisfactory Discord and to Reddit and to my Facebook uh, and to Twitter. So like, I made an effort to let people know that there was a video there. And even so, it was like, you know, nobody follows me. Even even at that, you only got 300 views. That's weird. You know, my adventure with oddly performing videos is one of the first videos I ever uploaded to YouTube is still the most popular. It has, I think, over Isn't that 4 crazy? million. Yeah, over 4 million views. And that's the, uh, the one where I play Roller Coaster Tycoon, and I basically throw a roller coaster at the guests. <laughs> right down the walkway, the boardwalk. Right, and just go bowling. Um, and that one, and it was set to They Might Be Giants music, which um, I, I now hate that song. <laughs> I used to like it. Uh, I'm actually listening to... Um, they might be giants a lot lately while well, I'm playing Satisfactory. And I'm I'm listening to their album Mink Car. But I every time older comes up that's the album it's from. And every time older comes up, I hit skip. I'm like, oh no. I cause I can only see um the roller coaster game in my head. Um Is that because you but, watched your own video so many times or just like it did I take guess. that long to edit or yeah, I think just in the process of making it, you know, you because I tried to time the video with the music so that, you know, yeah, yeah, oh, this it's part incredible is how many people seem to miss that aspect of music videos. Like you got to be into the music to be able to make a video that's synced up with it. And I don't know, I watched so many music videos where it's just like, here's a bunch of clips and they're not even synced to anything. They're just right. like random stuff like why did you how much effort did you put into this right now there is a bit of your brain will impart in fact i think i stumbled on this accidentally while editing the video together i noticed oh kind of that musical phrase ended just as i did the cut and that felt really good and it, you know those moments pop, popped up accidentally a lot and gave me the idea of like really trying to put it together but in the process of putting it together i just oh uh, at the time um i was win using windows movie maker and it had some you know this is microsoft's free software that shipped with i don't know windows what what windows were people using in in 2007 yeah, I don't 2000. Know. It, Vista. Windows 7? Windows Vista? Ugh. Vista, I'll bet. Anyway, it shipped free with Windows and it sucked. And when you started playing from the middle, like you just, you know, scan to some port in the video and hit play, it the audio will not be synced to the video. They'll be off by like a second. So if you want to actually see the timing, you had to watch the whole thing all the way through. And so uh, that was an excruciating, you know, yeah, make a few changes, make a few changes, and then watch the whole thing. And then make a few changes, make a few changes, watch the whole thing. So yeah, that took me a lot longer than it should have and basically drove me mad. And I can't look at the, uh, I can't listen to the song and I can't look at the video anymore. But after that took off and just got insane amounts of views, especially for the time, broke a million. I was like, oh, YouTube's easy. I just made a video and got a million <laughs> views. And, you know, 
everybody else, you know, you they'll they'll work for years trying to get a video that hits a million views. But the thing is, I didn't know why. And right. as an as an experiment, I tried doing basically the same thing again. Another They Might Be Giants song. No, Nobody talks about this video. This video is probably one of my worst performing on the entire channel. Um, okay, so this is really funny. The, my first video is my most popular at 14 million views. It's immediate follow-up um, has, in the last 14 years, accrued... 13,000 views, so less than a thousand a year. My worst performing video was right after my best performing one, and they were my first two videos. <laughs> uh, the video is It Tastes Like Asphalt, and it was, uh, it was the They Might Be Giants song Wicked Little Critta, which is actually not one of their more popular songs. That was a mistake. Well, it wasn't a mistake. It was an experiment, and that's what I was, you know, doing experiment. But it was set to one of the Grand Theft Auto games, and it was just me being really bad at the game. But I worked even harder to sync it all up so that, you know, different musical sections would have kind of different camera behavior, you know, different editing. And it was, yeah, nobody cared. It performed terribly. Hmm. So no accounting for basic, taste. Well, I think it's just that um, it's just the the algorithm is a mysterious thing. I, I mean, I, I'm not saying they're both equally good, but I'm just saying without you know when you don't know what makes a video, what made a video really popular, then you know just trying to brute force replicate it, it's just sort of an interesting creative experiment, right? Like, do the same thing again and get wildly divergent results. So, that's I my think story. It's my, favorite, my favorite uh, music video still is the TV show um, AMV. And oh, yeah, that cartoon that just cuts oh. from one TV to the next. Yes, that thing is brilliant. I learned so that much watching that over and over and over again when I was like eight or whatever. And uh, <gasps> you oh, were eight when that so came incredible. out. No. Now, I, I don't know. I I can't figure out when. It, well, it was released eleven years ago. The the one that I found. I've got a link in the in the show notes. But I don't I don't know. I thought it was older than that. Huh. But wait, you were. I was older than eight though. I must have been like fifteen. Still, you were a kid. I mean, I didn't realize how old it was. Um, anyway, that's fun. Yeah, it, it's yeah, just so that's... snappy, and it's always on point, and it's got, like, all the jokes and, like, repeated in-jokes, and then, like, the series start to bleed into each other, and it's just so good. So good. Also, the music is super catchy. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. It is brilliant work. Let me see. Uh, according to YouTube, it was uploaded in December of 2009. So how old were you then? Well, in 2009, I was out of college, but that can't be right. It's got to be older than that. Maybe it was... Uh, maybe it was um, made early, earlier, but then uploaded to, to YouTube in 2009. Yeah, was I seem to maybe... remember like going to some sort of site and like downloading it that wasn't YouTube. Right, this could have been. I mean, looking at the animation style, it could have been Flash or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It looks a little organic for Flash. Yeah, the it's got scratchy lines. Flash is sort of notorious for having super clean lines. And this mm. looks a bit humanized. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I seem to remember it was like an uh, MOV file or something. How oh, interesting. Hey, if you're listening to the show and you know where this video originally came from or its origin because the official listing is in Japanese so I cannot read it <laughs> uh, I just know it good um, so in other good news this week 
Yeah, all my topics were non-video game related, and you're staying on point. What's your video game looking forward to this week? Well, this was... Okay, Jennifer Snow. I know you know her in the comments. She's been around mm -hmm. for over a decade and is very active in the comments. And, um, and she wants you to know that Dungeons & Dragons Online is real good. But, but she's... Uh, she got me... Uh, she looked at my wish list and saw I wanted the MMO New World. And I got the email from Steam. It's like, hey, Jennifer Snow has gifted you New World. And I was like, oh, awesome. I didn't even realize it was out yet. And so I load it up. You know, I go to the page, and I, you know, hit down. Oh, it's not. It's not released yet. Oh, but I also got access to a preview. Oh, but I. That's not available yet either. So I got two games. One of them is the game and the other is the preview and neither one is available. And it's not. Um, and I think it doesn't come out until June. What? Which an eternity. Yeah. Right. How can I possibly wait that long? Um, but, you know, I wasn't really thinking about the game, but now that I have it, I'm super invested and excited. <laughs> yeah, you have something to look forward to. Because right. if you didn't have the game, you'd be like, all right, I'm going to see what the reviews are, and they're probably going to be all bullshit, and then I'm going to have to watch some teaser trailers, and they're probably going to be all fake, and like, is it going to be right. good or not? Who knows? Right, but now I am super looking forward to this, and I'll play it at launch. Instead, you know, since someone else bought it for me, I would have, if it was my own money, I would have waited till... You know, at least a week. For most MMOs, you want to make sure that you don't pay $60 to play one of those MMOs that blows up at launch and nobody can get in and there's horrible bugs and it uninstalls itself or causes problems or it won't <laughs> right. run. You know, MMOs are just notorious for having horrible launches. And that sucks. It's you just put the money down. for a Bitcoin mining scam or whatever. <laughs> right. But, you know, since Jennifer uh, gave it to me, I'm going to have it at launch. So I'm going to get to, you know, put on my crash helmet and try it out with everybody else on launch day. So that's fun. So I did actually look up New World. And so I know this is like a dumb question, but is this some sort of like conquistador simulator or something? It, no, it's trying to move away from the typical... MMO, okay, one of the problems you have in an MMO is the easiest, you know, you need to make a big world. But, and the easiest type of world to make is wilderness. That is like a million times easier than making cities, right? Hmm. I mean, the easiest of all is space games. <laughs> <laughs> that is... Since space is, in a statistical sense, empty, and there is nothing in the universe, you know, give or take a tiny, but give or take a tiny rounding error, the universe basically has nothing in it. So that gets really yeah, yeah. easy. Skybox, the game. What more could you ask for? <laughs> and all your assets are spheres? <sighs> give me a break. Right. Um, but... That's not as popular. EVE Online is a very particular flavor, and not everybody's into it. So most people want to have a little puppet, right? You want a puppet that runs around. Hmm. Your little, your avatar, your character. And you want to customize them and make them look just so, and pick a name that you think is really clever. Um, and then that one's taken... So you settle for like right. something clever with a number on the end or whatever. Right, exactly. And you show up in the world and you see some other guy with the same name but a different number. And you realize that Weed Smoker 69 isn't nearly as clever as you thought it was, <laughs> you dumbass. 69, Weed Smoker 69. No, that's taken too. All right. XX, Weed Smoker 69 XX. No, that's take it. Well, maybe if I add one more X. <laughs> oh, it's so frustrating. <laughs> uh, the only flaw with MMOs is all the other people, really. Anyway, 
you have the problem when you're designing an MMO is it the easiest you know you need to make so much content so you want to control control scope as well as you can because it's easy to kill yourself with scope creep and expensive assets mm -hmm. and one of the ways to do it is to set it in the wilderness but now we have played basically an infinite number of WoW clones by now. And we have Minecraft for all those people who just want wilderness. Right. So, but like in the MMO space, medieval fantasy has been done to death and then some. Like dragons, swords, wizards, we have seen it over and over and over and over and it's painful now and it is so hard to do something new and everybody's a little bit tired of it so the idea of new world is imagine like sort of a quasi european discovery of the americas the new world only it's a world of magic and supernatural things and it ends up looking very unlike mid. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be the same thing. You're going to have swords and you're going to have people casting spells. But this is at least sort of thematically, it feels a little different. And so are they course, actually trying to make a break from all historical civilizations and come up with something new? Or are they just kind of like going with Indian or Mesoamerican or something? I don't know. I mean, really, the trailers... Mm -hmm. All feature like your factions I think are various flavors of Europeans I mean they're not actually Europeans I don't think like there isn't like right right these are this so they've got half timber houses and they've got armor and right. swords and stuff right and it's interesting and there's a whole bunch of stuff like the world's gonna try and be more reactive to player action so that it's not just like a thousand people existing in the same static world now mm. that's been tried before yeah i was going to say we're getting into meta fatigue for mmos where not only right. have, has everything been tried but every variation has been tried as well but i'm really curious how it how it's gonna pan out okay i just looked it up and um you know, one of the most annoying things about searching for Wikipedia articles is when the thing itself has its own wiki. So, like, you're like, what? I want to look up, oh, yeah, <laughs> right. when does the first Destiny come out? Uh, uh, okay, Destiny wiki. And then I forget, and then it's like, takes me to the Destiny wiki. <laughs> the, the wiki just for Destiny, and I'm like, damn it. And, and then you're like, oh, oh, I want the second link. No, that's the other lesser competing wiki by a different group right. of fans. The fan wiki. Right. And then the third one is another, like, weird fan wiki that was abandoned two months after launch, but still, okay. And then somewhere halfway down the page, it'll finally link you to the Wikipedia article. It's, this is not a, this is not a horrible problem. It's just an amusing problem. And I'm so used to Google being awesome that just you see the name of the game and wiki in the article and I just click on it every time and then like, wait, why is Wikipedia <laughs> loading so slow? Why is it covered in ads? Why have I fallen for this trick like for the millionth time? Why don't I learn from my mistakes? Why am I so <laughs> stupid? This really is like not even first. This is like zero with world problems. Right. Right. It's more, and the problem is between my ears. Like, I don't think, the, the answer was there in the first six search results. The search engine did its job. It's just, I've been so conditioned to just click on the first thing because that's always right. It's almost like Google is so good, I can't handle it when it's not perfect. Usually I just search for like the name of the thing and then game. And then it's got like the little info box on the right that has a Wikipedia article. That would be another thing I could do that would be better than mindlessly clicking on the first result. There are a lot of other things I could do besides making that mistake for the hundredth time. Okay, so you went to Wikipedia is what you're saying.
Yeah, yeah, I wanted to make sure before I talked about this, but yes, this is the second game from Amazon Game Studios. Now, ah, I, are they using I, Lumberyard then? Yes, that's the and um, I I dislike how they're launching their new studio. I feel strongly that I mean their first game what was released then it was so buggy and horrible it unreleased like they stopped the servers and they said sorry everybody we're going to go work on this for another year and we'll come back and then during oh, that wow. year i was going to ask what their first game was but apparently it was just like a smoking crater <laughs> right <laughs> right um and uh oh and it's named crucible that literally is a smoking yes. crater right <laughs> right but so they took it offline for like, oh, we're going to fix it up nine months from now or whatever. We'll, we'll be back. And then during that nine months, they just canceled the game. Wow. So that game... Took it to a farm that is, upstate? That's not the biggest MMO failure. The biggest MMO failure in history is APB, All Points Bulletin. One of the most expensive MMOs ever made. Cost $200 million. And I think the servers were online for 70 days. And then they closed it down. Oh. Um, it was still on... Uh, I was like walking through Target after it had closed down. I was like going to write about it. It was This was back in the early days, you know, when I was writing at The Escapist. And I was thinking of doing a Let's Play on it. Because it was just so stupid. The whole thing was dumb. But I thought, you know, I, I could I could write about that, but then they just shut the game down. But then I was walking through Target a few days later and I saw it for sale for full price. And this is back before you could return a game. It was possible to plonk down $60, take this home, install it, and discover the game servers were offline and you just bought a coaster. Oh, man. Yeah, I just so looked up the, the development cost for World of Warcraft, and it was only it was less than a hundred million dollars. Like it's just so yeah. crazy, right? Chump change, really. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, we can't call Crucible the biggest failure, but it is definitely one of the great failures of MMOs, and that is a fiercely contested category, right there. Is um, enormous MMO failures is just so many it's a race to the bottom yeah so that was and, the and first Crucible game did cost a lot of money i'm sure right um and i'm not surprised that's a hard thing to do to operate at that scale like if you form yeah a, and as a brand new studio right like if you form a brand new movie studio your first project should not be Avengers Endgame. Make a couple of rom-coms. <laughs> build a relationship with a few directors. Get, you know, build relationships with people in the industry and get a feel for how the machinery works and get everybody cooperating. And then you put down your hundreds of millions of dollars for your big risky projects. After, and that way, you know, if your first couple of projects pancake, you're losing tens of millions of dollars instead of hundreds of millions. But no, Amazon... I mean, this is a disagreement. I have, Everybody, yeah, well, like, are... You know, and I, in addition to not losing a ton of money, you're also not doing it publicly in front of everyone, right? right? You, you want to fail small so that people don't see you as a failure. I mean, ideally. Right. And every time I say this, people are like, well, you don't understand, Seamus. That's how business runs these days. And I'm like, yeah, that's the point I'm making. Is I think this is a dumb waste of money. And I think <laughs> people like this is how the tech sector often works. People think they need to launch something at scale, at global scale. And it's like, no, start small get good then expand your your goal should not be yeah avengers endgame should not be your first movie 
And so I really disagree with Amazon Game Studios. I mean, it is just so hard to branch out into this particular... This is a merciless industry. Um, and it's just stupid to try and go this big right out of the gate. It's just self-defeating. And probably a contributor to why... <laughs> why it's only the big publishers you know somebody new shows up and they just like well we're gonna compete with the biggest games ever and then they make a giant boondoggle and crash and fail and it's like no get good <laughs> so that is frustrating and their second game is gonna be an mmo so i have to be there for that i have to be there to see okay is this just crucible 2 or did they learn enough from their first failure to do to make a real game? Yeah. Well, and and also to drive the comparison home, like if you're gonna make Avengers Endgame, you have to start somewhere. And Marvel Studios started with Iron Man. Right. Like, that's not a. That's not like they started with Crucible. Like <laughs> they succeeded out right. of the gate. Right. Yeah. And. Mm, Iron Man 1, if you go and look at it, the number of really complex CGI-driven, big-budget shots, not that big. I mean, it, it's certainly blockbuster, but it is not what Marvel movies would become. This just giant mass of just incredibly expensive special effects and CGI in every scene. And, uh... Yeah, it, that was a much safer way. To, so they did start modest. <laughs> I mean, they, they were sh aiming yeah. high. And, and it was like a subsidiary of Fox, which has been doing this for decades. So it, it wasn't even like it's the brand new web behind the air studio just trying something out. Right. It's crazy. So I have to be there for New World and see what's going on. How's this one going to turn out? Let's do some mailbag questions. Dear Diecast, skip two paragraphs. Uh, the, this entire mail will be in the show notes and is worth reading. But just to keep things flowing, I'm just going to read the ending question. So my question for the two of you is, what are your red flags for fiction? Books, video games, and music. If you're reading a book slash playing a game, what are the things that would make you throw it at the wall in disgust and start foaming at the mouth with rage? Keep being awesome, Lino. And the the previous two paragraphs talked about somebody said, I'll never read a book where the first sentence describes the weather. Like, oh, that's just unforgivable. And, you know, why? Why, why would you disc discount a book based on the first line <laughs> might be important contrast it sets a mood i actually think that's a creatively valid thing to do it you're setting you're explaining both the the visual sense of what the place looks like and the mood of the piece and that's perfectly legitimate thing to lead off with uh, the, a great example of this is, okay, I'm not holding up this up as a great example, but the first line of A Wrinkle in Time was, it was a dark and stormy night. Now that is super cliche. I would not advise starting <laughs> off a book like that. Then again, Wrinkle in Time is friggin' old. It probably wasn't a worn out cliche at that point. I don't know, Snoopy was doing it for a while. Right. Um, but my red, do you have any red flags of a, of something that puts you off of work right away? Well, I usually, for books at least, I like to just flip to somewhere in the middle and just like read a paragraph and see if it's any good. Um, and usually by that point, the author has shown their hand and has kind of hit their stride and is doing what they're, they came here to do. And so, like, if it's good, cool. I can I can work with that. If there's something in there that's like, oh, that's a little weird. Like, this is some weird fixation in the narrative or, like, the way they're talking is stilted or something. It's like, eh, I have better things to do with my time. And uh, 
my literature teacher in, in high school always said like reading a random paragraph is like taking taking a sip of milk like if it's gone bad probably the whole thing is bad that's a good point uh things that put me off um the authors i've only personally run into this once or twice uh, back in the 90s, I was really into Tom Clancy, back when Tom Clancy wrote his own friggin' novels. Because, you know, he's become a uh, a worn-out joke by now, but back in the 80s and 90s, Tom Clancy was friggin' legend. His books were amazing. Uh, oh, they're so good. But, you know, I kind of plowed through all of his stuff, and then started exploring the rest of the genre and i ran into a lot of crap uh one thing that absolutely makes me crazy and makes me want to stop reading is when the author is really really in interested in telling me what all the women look like like just has to tell me how big her boobs are before we can have a conversation with her and it feels very alien to me and very off-putting. Like if you it's imagine kind of you're voyeuristic, right? Well, if you imagine you're hanging out with your person, oh yeah, my friend Patty, she works in accounting. She's got like really big knockers. Uh, okay, I'm not sure why you told me that. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's my friend. There's my friend Susan. She's she's pretty flat-chested, honestly. And I'm like, why are you telling me this? What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to imagine a scenario in which this is an appropriate thing to say, but I'm having trouble. Help me out here. Right. Like, maybe if, you know, the person's looks are incredibly important and play a role in the story, then go for it. But just the weird a describing how sexy all the ladies are is just absolutely... And it was like um, a common in the... In the people that wanted to imitate Tom Clancy. Okay, we're going to have a bunch of really dry technical stuff in there. But it was never as well researched <laughs> as Clancy's stuff. Clancy made it interesting. Uh, and they were just like, here's a wall of text telling you how some obscure technology works or some system of the world. Oh, and we'll make, you know, all the males are boring flat ciphers and all the females are knockouts with very little to do in the story. And I'm like, oh, this is weird. So that's that's a big turnoff for me, ironically. <laughs> Paradoxically. Right. Uh, and just the, the... And just the stuff I've been on about for years. You know, stories where the main character doesn't have agency or but i guess we're looking for things that jump out at you immediately and like so oh this this character isn't driving the story is not a thing that jumps out at you that's something you notice during reflection yeah so i guess just the author telling me what all the women look like is weird also when oh really common in the techno thriller genre is main characters that are trying too hard to be cool. They, they, the, the author just has to tell me how cool this person is and everything they oh, do. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, they win every conversation. Um, <laughs> oh. you know, the, you know they, they've got to put down that just shuts up the other person, which is, you know, not how arguments work in the real world. <laughs> Not how any argument I've ever been in worked. Oh, I yeah, insulted yeah. the other person so they stop arguing with me. No, that's not really how it works. Um, yeah, just that kind of right. self-indulgent stuff. If you're not hero protagonist from Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, you're not cool and you just have to be okay with that. Right. One of the book, my most hated books is called Day of the Delphi. Just one of those obscure, like, action kind of... I don't know if it was qual if it counted as a techno-thriller, but it, it was definitely in that space and got lumped in with those books on the shelf, if you see what I mean. 
and someone yeah. bought it for me. Like the first scene is this drug kingpin has captured the hero. And is the hero is just absolutely confident. He's got his they're up on the high, like the penthouse of the of a hotel. And the good guys got his hands tied behind his back and the, the bad guys monologuing at him and then it's you know you know tells his goons to throw him out the window or throw him off the balcony and then all of a sudden the hero has his hands free he's uh, he's freed himself how well he's just really good that's how knots work they don't work if you're really good <laughs> And then all of a sudden he beats up all these guys that have guns and don't shoot him. And it was like, I, I this is his introduction as a character. And it's basically, he just cheats. <laughs> He's just cheating at life. I don't know. He entered cheat codes and like, did he pause time or something? That was, and but I read the whole thing for some reason. And like the whole book is super cringe. Um. But that's the worst one. And it had a million red flags. And I realized right away that I was reading trash. But for some reason, I kept going. But I was like 23. I didn't know what I was doing with my life. I guess if I had to summarize, like, what to look out for in fiction to know if you're reading something that's worthwhile or not, it would have to be TV tropes. Wait, explain that. You just have to read TV tropes, the wiki, and like, get to know all that stuff and then you can see it when it happens because like all the you know all the author insert stuff where you know, like the the protagonist is winning arguments with his his deadbeat wife right and it's like did the author have a deadbeat right. wife what's going on here or or all the the stuff where it, you know show don't tell uh kind of stuff or you know descriptions of things that aren't necessary or uh it was an author wank and you know with the describing women and how hot they are or whatever and it's like yeah i see what's going on here i don't like it i'm gonna go do something else right right and tv tropes is interesting because it sort of like by listing all these things they always the site will always tell you tropes are tools tropes are not bad but i think there, there needs to be a footnote there that if the audience immediately recognizes the trope and it takes them out of the story because they're like, oh, this again, okay, I know what's going to happen next and I know everything that the storyteller is doing because I've seen this so often, that is bad. Tropes are tools, but you can use a tool poorly. Don't use a tool poorly. I think the probably the worst book that I did finish reading all the way through was, I don't even remember the title and I don't want to look it up because it was just bad, but it was, it was a, I was trying to do some research for a book that I was writing and it was um, like steampunk clockwork kind of thing. And so I went to the local library and like looked up steampunk clockwork, whatever, you know, a bunch of search terms and uh, trying to find some fiction that I could read for reference to be like, okay, what else is out there? What else is in the genre? And uh, got it on an interlibrary loan. There was like one or two books in the whole system that, that fit that stuff. And so I read this thing and it was so, it was so strange. It was like, it was like the author had, the author felt like chauvinism was a really bad problem in real life. And they projected that problem into their fictional world, but didn't bother explaining that it was a problem in, in the setting. They just like had their main character run into all these people who were, and, and, and the people that they ran into weren't chauvinistic either, but the person, the main character was like berating people for being chauvinistic all the time. It was so, oh, so strange. Weird. That yeah. is Yeah. And it's like, and it didn't have anything to do with clockwork or anything. And then like right at the end, like, like the, the ending was all like out of nowhere. It was literally ex machina because it's like, you know, this giant machine or whatever. And like, okay, fair enough. It's a clockwork kind of, you know, setting. But also, it didn't make any sense. Right. <laughs> Making sense is important to me. Yeah. It, well, and especially if you're dealing with like a whole system that's like mechanical, like you'd expect the author to have done some research on like, how does the mechanism actually work? You know, like what are gears for? Right. Really, though. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 
like I wanted to make a story about a machine, but I know nothing. I can't. I have no intuition for machines. So like every th every time I talk about the machine, I, it's I'm just making something that's wrong and off putting and confusing for the audience. Yeah, it's it was like, really sad because like I read the whole thing. I was really hoping that there was something good in there, but it was all just really weird. It's very. It wasn't even tropey weird, right? Where it's just like, oh, you know, here's this bad trope and this bad trope and this bad trope. It was just like, where are you getting this stuff, man? Are you reading? What, who read? Who wrote this? What? How did this get in here? How did this make it into a library? <laughs> Why is this on the shelf and not being put into the furnace to keep us warm? Um. Uh. So the chauvinism one, I think, is is also that's another one i feel really off-putting that a storyteller will go out of his way to have some sexist straw man and they do it in such yeah. a stupid and clumsy way now it's supposed now this is a thing that is designed to be cathartic you set up a horrible stupid obnoxious jerk and then they get their comeuppance, right? They get humiliated or beat up or whatever. They get put in their place or they suffer the consequences of having bad ideas in their head, right? Sure. Um, and it could be like a kind of a morality play kind of thing, right? You're right. Like, oh, well, see, this is what happens to people who make poor choices. I'm like, okay, that, there's some value in that. But so often it's done so clumsily that it takes me out of the story a, a classic one this is right in the, the in the commercial for the supergirl tv show um she like is with a bunch of military guys and they're giving her shit for being a woman and she's there in her supergirl costume and <laughs> these men are all aware that she's fucking supergirl that she could throw a bus. Like, they, it, these guys are too stupid to believe in. And just too obviously. The, what, what you should do as a writer is, say, have these guys talk down to all the other women. Okay? And not do that to Supergirl. Before Supergirl, before she walks on scene, right? They're like... You cut to them before they're going to have an interview or she's going to come on base or whatever. And he, and they're all talking down to the ladies, bringing them coffee and like the other cadets or whatever. And then she shows up and they're all suddenly really respectful. And you're like, okay, these guys are jerks. Right. And then there would be some callback or comeuppance for that. Like, oh, now you have to, ins you've been putting down women the whole time. And now you have to suffer the indignity of being rescued by one and then she can drop a one-liner to throw some of your own attitude back in your face like something right because she's got say, super hearing and she heard what they were saying even though they didn't know or right. whatever or she was or she was present in her secret identity like she was in the room and maybe you know oh sure um or whatever she's she knows about it and then when she saves the day or does something heroic they look like idiots that's how you do it, but you don't have them talk to Supergirl like she's a three-year-old. Just, it's too stupid to believe right, it. Right, right. And if, if the characters that are being chauvinistic or whatever are also just blathering idiots, then it's not like, oh, that's, this is bad to act this way. It's just like, oh, these poor idiots, they don't know what they're saying. Right? <laughs> it's like, well, she can save you from the... She can save you from the avalanche, but she can't do anything about your stupidity. I'm sorry. Uh huh. And it's like I was thinking the, well, the other way to do it would be to like have the characters have read the script and like you know show the filming where they're like, uh, do we have to say this to Supergirl? She's gonna kill us. No, no, this the lines. Oh, okay. And then they read it all. And they, like they say the line, but they're all like terrified of what's gonna happen. Right. So get me a, a coffee and then he ducks under his desk just expecting right, to be right. blasted by eye lasers <laughs> yeah so that's another thing that and it's just th that is a subset of just a really self-indulgent author that wants to set up a scenario but doesn't want to pay for it and doesn't 
have respect for his own villains or her own you know the author doesn't have respect for their villains villains are people too i mean right. if you just like yeah. there, there's no fun in like i build a scarecrow and then i write a little sign and hang it on the scarecrow that's like hi i'm from and the name of political party and then i'll kick the crap out of the scarecrow that's like not cathartic <laughs> if you make the villain too much of a straw man then it can't work it can't accomplish the thing that it that it set out to accomplish because this is no longer refuting the people like this in the real world it's refu refuting this bizarro world of people that would like put down supergirl <laughs> right like who who would think that that's a smart thing to do like no one and and even in the situation where there might be someone who'd think that that's a good idea, they're not going to be there. Like, someone else is going to be there. Right. Everybody would be like, let's not send Bob to the meeting with Supergirl. Let's give him something else to do and send literally anyone else to the meeting. Right. Oh, my God. Uh, Bob, Bob's walking towards Supergirl. Somebody, you tell him, get him out of there. <laughs> <laughs> you could actually make a really funny buddy cop movie about that, right? Where there's like one buddy, one of the two guys is just like this terrible person, and the other one's always trying to like shield him from the public, like keep him out of, right. out of away from the mayor or whatever. He says incredibly inappropriate things to minorities, not hateful things, but just really cringy, like <laughs> right, uncomfortable you know, stereotypes right. or whatever. Just things that make you embarrassed by proxy and his partner's always trying to get him to shut up or distract him or or trying to recontextualize things so that it, no no that's not what he was saying. <laughs> well, that's not what he meant. I'm I'm sure. Uh, there's an important. Oh, we have a call. We have to go. That's funny. All right. I was worried we didn't have enough show to to fill the hour, but. We had more than enough. We only did one mailbag, and we've got two left, which we will get next week. Sorry, I, it's not my fault. Sometimes Paul just talks a lot, and I let him go. I apologize. Um, that's what happened, Apologize? Right? Oh, speaking of cringy things to say that are embarrassing by proxy. <sighs> Quick, end the show. End the show. All right. Thanks to everybody who tolerated this disaster. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Oh, you didn't end it fast enough. Now I'm free. I'm free!